Welcome to week 10's recorded lecture. We continue our discussions of hearsay. This week's readings are on pages 367 to 404 of your casebook. The first case that we covered was R. V. Perry. This is a court of criminal appeal in England from 1909. As background, Perry was accused of murder as revolt as the result of an abortion that he performed on a young girl, Agnes. On the evening that Agnes died, a doctor said loud enough for her to hear that she might die at any moment. The morning that she had died, Agnes told her sister, I shall go, and then told her a secret, that Perry had performed an abortion on her. Without the sister's testimony of this statement, there was likely not enough evidence to convict Perry. At issue in this case was whether the statement would be admissible as a dying declaration hearsay exception. This court held that the key question was whether the speaker had a expectation of death and in their words, an abandonment of all hope of living. The court also held that there was a time element so that the death had to be imminent, but they didn't define what imminent meant exactly. The next case was State v. Williams. This was a Supreme Court of North Carolina case from 1872. As background, the decedent in this case was shot after dark while sitting at the fireplace in his home. He was shot through a hole in the logs of his house. The decedent said that Edward, Edward Williams had shot him, even though he didn't see Williams. At issue was whether or not the decedent's statement of who shot him qualified as a hearsay exception. The court held that this evidence should have been excluded at trial. The decedent, like any in-court witness, must have personal knowledge of their statements or of their testimony. So in this case, the decedent was assuming who had shot him based on incidents that had happened prior to the shooting. So this statement that he gave after he was shot wasn't because he had seen Williams shoot him, but because they had prior incidents together and he assumed it was Williams. The next case is Garza v. Delta Tau Delta Fraternity National. This is a Supreme Court of Louisiana case from 2006. This case was a civil suit involving a dying declaration. So the statement here was a suicide note that was written by Courtney Garza, who was in good health at the time that she wrote the suicide note. The day after writing it, Garza did commit suicide, and then the note included a rape that had led to Garza's decision to commit suicide. At issue was whether or not this type of statement counted as a dying declaration hearsay exception when the immediateness of the declarant's death was the declarant's own decision to commit suicide. As a holding, the lower courts had held that yes, this did count as a dying declaration, but the Supreme Court reversed. Many people attempt or contemplate suicide without actually completing the act, However, dissenting judges here noted that there was only a day that had passed between Garza's note and her suicide, so they felt that that should have been immediate enough to qualify as a dying declaration. However, the majority did not agree. The majority also felt that the length of time since the rape, which was described in the note, was a factor counting against the note's admissibility. We will go over the casebook hypos on page 375, so please be prepared to discuss. Again, there are many casebook hypos in this week's reading, so we might not get to all of them, but do please review them on your own. The next case that we read was Giles v. California. This is a Supreme Court case from 2008. As background, the defendant had shot his girlfriend to death. At trial, he argued self-defense 
And the prosecution introduced a statement that the girlfriend, Brenda, had made to the police after a different incident three weeks before the shooting. The issue at trial was whether this statement was testimonial and therefore violated the defendant's confrontation clause because the girlfriend could not be at trial to be cross-examined because she had been murdered. As a holding, a few of the judges felt that the statements were not testimonial. However, ultimately, the California Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of the United States held that these statements were testimonial. So if the statements were testimonial, then the defendant was never given the opportunity to cross-examine his girlfriend, which then violated his confrontation clause rights. Though there was the question of whether killing Brenda made the defendant forfeit that right. The defendant contended that he did not forfeit the right, and the court held that he could not have forfeited that right unless he had killed his girlfriend for the purpose of rendering her unavailable as a witness, and the court felt that he had not done that here. There are four casebook hypos on pages 386 and 387 of your casebook. Again, review these on your own, and if there is time, we will discuss as a class. The next case is United States v. Owens. This is another Supreme Court case from 1988. As background, the defendant was charged with assault with intent to commit murder on John Foster, who was a counselor at a federal prison. The defendant beat Foster with a pipe, fracturing his skull and causing severe memory impairment. When Foster was interviewed by the FBI, he couldn't remember the defendant's name. However, in a second interview, Foster described the attack and did identify the defendant. At trial, Foster remembered identifying the defendant, but didn't remember seeing his assailant at the time of the attack. When questioned on cross-examination at trial, Foster didn't remember who had visited him in the hospital after the attack and didn't know if any of the visitors had suggested that the defendant was the attacker. At issue was, should the prior identification statements by Foster have been admissible at trial given his memory defects? The court held that despite these memory issues, his prior identification of the defendant was properly admitted because the defendant had the opportunity to cross-examine Foster at trial, which satisfied the Confrontation Clause and Rule 801 D1C. There are more casebook hypos on page 390. Again, please prepare to discuss these as a class. The next case is Baker v. State. This is a Court of Special Appeals of Maryland from 1977. The defendant here was accused of robbery and murder. Shortly after being attacked, the victim, in the presence of police officers Bolton and Huck, confronted the defendant and stated that she was not among the group that had attacked him. At trial, the defendant's lawyer was not permitted to introduce a report prepared by one of the officers to refresh the other officer's recollection. The trial judge had ruled that the use of this report was impermissible because one of the officers, Bolton, did not have the personal knowledge of his contents because it was written by the other officer, Huck. At issue was, should the defense counsels have been allowed to refresh the officer's recollection with the contents of the other officer's police report? And was this really an issue of past recollection recorded or refreshed recollection? The appeals court reversed this case and stated that the trial judge was confused. He was mixing up past recollection recorded where personal knowledge is necessary, with refreshing a witness's recollection, where any kind of device or document can be used regardless of their personal knowledge. 
So the report in this case would not have been admissible as a past recollection recorded. For this exception, this hearsay exception, a witness, a witness does have to testify that they have no memory of the contents of the document, but can testify that they wrote it or adopted it and that it was accurate when it was made. So here, Bolton would not have been able to testify that he had made the other officer's report or testify to how accurate was it was because he did not write it and he did have some memory of this incident that was in the report. However, another officer's report can be used to just refresh Bolton's recollection of the events. The next case is Adams v. New York Central. This is a court of common pleas from Cleveland, Ohio in 1961. A plaintiff brought this action to recover for personal injuries. The defendant claimed that the injuries had never occurred. At trial, to prove this, the defendant tried to introduce an interview of the plaintiff by an insurance investigator as a past recollection recorded. In the interview, the plaintiff did not talk about any of his injuries that he was seeking to recover for at trial. The plaintiff's attorney objected and the trial judge sustained the objection. At issue was whether or not this was reversible error to keep out the investigator's interview. The court here held that yes, it was. In this case, the defendant's counsel was laying this groundwork on appeal for this decision to be reversed because it clearly fell under the past recollection recorded exception. At trial, the plaintiff's attorney should not have objected to this. Instead, they could have argued that just because in this interview the plaintiff didn't mention the injury, the injury, it doesn't mean that the injuries weren't present. Instead, by objecting to something that did clearly fall within this hearsay exception, they were setting this case up for appeal, which then could be reversed. The next case is United States v. Venue. This is the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit from 1999. Here, the defendant was convicted of money laundering and other charges surrounding a drug conspiracy. The defendant appealed because the trial court allowed Western Union to send money forms to be introduced at trial to prove that the defendant had sent money to other conspirators. On these forms, the sender writes their name, their address, their phone number, and some other personal inf information. The originals are then kept for six months, and then the information is recorded in a computer database. The government here introduced 70 of these two send money forms, 21 of which the defendant was the sender. The government argued that these records were actually business records. So why did this argument fail? On page 401 of your casebook, you can see the court's holding here that, and I'll quote it, the difficulty is that despite its language, the business record exception does not embrace statements contained within a business record that were made by one who is not a part of the business, if the embraced statements are offered for their truth. So here, even though the document itself might be a business record, when you are trying to introduce statements on those records that were made by someone who is not a part of the business, that in and of itself is another hearsay element. So if there is no hearsay exception for those statements, then those statements cannot come in at trial. So a question, could these two send money forms have been admitted for a different purpose? So yes, at trial, they could have been redacted and then still admitted to show that the transfers occurred, which then could go along with other testimony about the drugs and the money laundering activities with other witnesses to strengthen their case at trial without having to overcome the obstacle of the statements being hearsay within the business record exception. Mm 
We then ended our readings with more case book hypos on page 403. Please do prepare to discuss these as a class. And next week, we will continue to discuss additional hearsay exceptions, which will be what we discuss for the next two weeks at the end of the semester.